awesome. Thank you so much, Scott. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, welcome to this webinar for Smashing Magazine on technical SEO for single page web apps. So today I'd like to talk about, well, fundamentally four things, well, three things really, and then I'll give you a bunch of pointers uh, to do more research because I only have a limited amount of time um, available for this. So, uh, and, and as I said, like SEO is broad, right? So there's like lots of other things to dig in. Um, I'd like to start with how a search engine works because I, am, I think that the understanding of how search engines process websites is fundamental to understand where we can face problems or challenges um, and then also how to solve them. Uh, then I'll go over a few basics. Uh, as I don't know what your current level is, I would like to cover some very fundamental bits and pieces. And then I would like to dive into certain specific challenges that uh, I keep seeing questions coming up over and over and over again. Um, so yeah, and then I'll give you a bunch of pointers to like dig in deeper and then we do the Q&A bits. All right. So first things first, how do search engines work? So as a developer, I like to think of search engines or their bots as they call them um, to be fundamentally an API that consumes the web assets that we put out, which are either apps or websites or whatever it is that we produce that can be crawled and has a, has a URL. Um, other people like to think of them differently. So a friend of mine, usually refers to them as the librarian uh, of, of the internet, like an automated librarian who tries to figure out what is this URL's content about and then uh, allows people to find it through uh, a query interface. Uh, a coworker of mine defines it more as a user with assistive technology needs as our user, um, which is the bot, isn't necessarily behaving like, like you and me might browse the web. They are um, they require certain affordances that many people require as well. So accessibility is actually a really nice overlap. So like if you get your accessibility right, you usually also uh, help bots and crawlers understand and navigate your content better. We're going to see a few examples of that uh, throughout the rest of the talk. But basically, how does your website get into a search engine? Now, this works more or less the same for all search engines, but I can't really make much of a point about that because I don't know these search engines, right? I haven't seen their code. I can't really interact with them besides being a user of them. However, there's one search engine that I know a little better and that's Google search. So my specific example uh, is oriented around how Googlebot does it, how Google search indexes websites. Um, but fundamentally, it's like the same building blocks have to be present in pretty much every search engine anyways. And it starts off with a list of URLs. Uh, we call this our crawl queue. It's like basically literally just a list of many, many URLs that we discovered or know about somehow. Um, and the first step we do is we have our crawler take a, list, uh, take a URL from the list and then make an HTTP request to that URL. That's the very basic bit here. If you have used curl or like made a fetch request to something, and then you fundamentally did what a crawler does. It makes an HTTP request, gets the response back, and passes the response on um, to another piece of the pipeline that actually like looks into processing what the response was. Now, if the response was an HTML document, um, then one of the first things that we do is we look into the HTML to find links and linked URLs. Because if we find URLs that are linked from this page, then we can put them right back into our crawl queue and the next instance of a crawler will make an HTTP request to them. And this way, we basically crawl our way from website to website, from page to page on your websites. Um, and we discover the web more or less. So this is the discovery phase. We have now parsed the HTML, we found linked websites and we can continue crawling. At the same time, we also understand that websites these days are a lot more complex than just HTML documents, right? If I get an HTML document that has a bunch of content in it, that is great because then I can also see what it is about. However, if it's a client side rendered single page application, I don't have this information. The HTML basically just loads a bunch of uh, JavaScript that then in turn, once the JavaScript is executed, would um, get all the content and render that together. So we can't really make much of an assumption based on what we get from the HTTP 
uh, response where we just have like a bunch of HTML. If we do that, we can skip the next steps, but we might not, uh, especially if it's a new website, we always render because we don't know if the JavaScript would make a big, big change. So we queue this for rendering, and once we have the resources available, which is usually within a couple of seconds or minutes or maybe hours, um, it can take a little longer in certain edge cases, but that's like more rare than people make you believe. Um, then we basically render it. What does rendering mean? Fundamentally, it is nothing else than opening a Chrome browser. So we open a headless Chrome. Um, the, the headless Chrome is, is basically using Puppeteer, more or less, uh, to, to load the page, render everything, um, and then we extract information from the page and pass this, this basic information back as a HTML uh, to the processing step, which now can actually look for links again because the HTML might have generated more links in the content. We can then crawl these uh, later on from the queue as well, uh, and it also puts it in the index. So this renderer is literally a Chromium. It is an evergreen Chromium. Um, we do not uh, run an outdated version anymore. You might encounter people like, but that's version 41. That's no longer true. Uh, we are actually updating within a couple of weeks for every, uh, it's like following every stable release of Chrome, we are updating our Googlebot to render with the latest version that is stable. Uh, okay, now that we have the content for sure, because we have rendered it using the JavaScript on the page, even if it's a client-side rendered uh, single page app, we should have all the content together. So we can look at what is this website about? What is this specific page about? Uh, is this a recipe? Is this your landing page? Is this your product? Is this a list of products? What is it? Um, and then we, we put it in an index, which a library would also do, right? You have a book. This book is about cats. Cool, it's about cats' diets. So it's like uh, cats and cat food and cat nutrition, I don't know. And then you basically have an index of all the books that are somehow touching cats and uh, filed on the cats and then dogs and then other, other topics as well. So that's what our index really is. Um, and now as, as a user, you come to the search engine and ask a question like, what is a cheap toaster? Or what is the best toaster in 2019? Or what is the fastest toaster? Um, and then what we do is basically we go to the index and ask for toasters, everything we have on toasters. And then we get a lot of pages and we're like, okay, but this one is specifically asking for fast toasters. So which of these things in the index is about fast toasters, which already reduces our, our selection. And then we use like hundreds of factors um, to figure out which order we should bring the results in, and then we display these results. The ordering process is called ranking. As I said, we use many hundreds of factors. Um, I personally think as a developer, you should not worry too much about it. And as an SEO, honestly, not as much as well. If you are providing good quality content and you get all the technology bits and all the strategic bits uh, in, in a row, all the ducks in a row, so to speak, then you should be fine. Um, ranking just keeps fluctuating. People ask different questions. Uh, so like ranking for a specific keyword isn't as important as it might have been 20 years ago. Uh, ranking for toasters doesn't mean much if people are looking for cheap toasters and yours is a high-end designer toaster, right? That's, that's pointless. It's great that you rank for toasters, but do you really get much business out of it uh, if, if people click on you and don't like what they are seeing? Um, so that I would rather not discuss ranking when we're not really talking about ranking today. Um, but fundamentally, I want you to focus and zoom in on crawling, uh, processing, rendering, and indexing. Those are the things that you can really influence um, by making the right decisions fundamentally. So how does that look like um, in order to like be found? What do you need to make sure that your your web page uh, has? Well, one thing is like, as I said, we are looking for link URLs in the pages that we already know, in the URLs that we already know. So if there is a page that we already know that links to it, then we will eventually probably crawl it. Um, another way of doing it, so like if you post on a very well-known public website somewhere, um, or if you have like a, a website that is like associated with you somehow and they give you a link, uh, then that would help you be discovered it doesn't help you rank. It doesn't help you any, with anything else, really. What I'm saying is it helps you being discovered, right? There's another way of being discovered, which is you can use Search Console and say like, hi, I own this website and here's proof. 
Um, you can do that with various ways and, and, and uh, mechanisms like DNS, and you can put something in, HTTP, in, in HTML. I think an HTTP header works as well. There's like a bunch of ways of doing this. Uh, Search Console is free. Um, it's a really, really powerful monitoring and uh, optimization tool really as well. Um, it comes straight from Google. Um, and uh, you can also submit your, your URL there. You basically can tell us like here is a uh, URL that I want you to crawl. Um, alternatively, you can also tell us, you know, basically you give us a sitemap, which is an XML file, and you tell us like these are the URLs that my website consists of, and then we can use that information to discover your content, which means discovering, again, crawling it, and then feeding it into the rest of the pipeline. It's the very, very first step. And uh, if we can't find your URL somewhere, either through a link or by you submitting it to us, then we won't know about it, right? Um, which brings me to like a bunch of other things that I want you to look into when you build websites and web apps, especially single page apps, uh, for, for these specific problems quite often. And um, I think they are very basic, but I am surprised how many people are still getting it wrong. And not just like 10 years ago, they're getting it wrong today. So I'll talk about them. First things first, link your pages properly. When I say link URLs, I mean it has a link tag and that link tag has a URL that we can crawl, right? So this will be, it's a relative URL. We'll add the host to it, fine, we can crawl this. This is perfectly okay as well. There's an on-click handler that we don't care about because Googlebot doesn't click on your things. Which brings us to this URL. This URL is problem. Hi, Vitaly, how's it going? Oh, sorry. I didn't Not a problem. Um, so this, this, you, uh, this link is problematic, right? This link does not have a URL attached to it. We don't click on things. So this link is meaningless to us. This the link, as far as we can tell, goes nowhere. This also goes nowhere. This just goes to the current document that we are on. So we already know this page. So whatever it does, when I click on it, we don't care. Because this URL is not something that we would put in the crawl queue. This neither, right? This URL can't be made an HTTP request to. How would I make an HTTP request to JavaScript go to? That doesn't work. Um, that's not even a link. Rule of thumb is if it takes you somewhere to different content, it's a link. If this does not take you somewhere but performs an action on the page that you're on, that's a button, that's cool. But if it is supposed to bring me to a different page, that's bad because that's not what it's meant for. Uh, this is like super bad. As I said, the crawler is basically a user with assistive technology needs. Um, as you need accessibility uh, features, this is text as far as the browser knows uh, that has an on-click handler. Sure, you can make it somewhat work by using ARIA, but you just shouldn't. You just use a link and everything will be fine. So please don't use any of these things. Just stick to proper links. You can overwrite their behavior using JavaScript if you have to, um, but as far as we are concerned, a link with a URL is what we care for to discover pages. When I say links and URLs, I want to highlight that um, URLs are very specifically specified in a specification. That's a lovely sentence. There's a standard for URLs. There's actually multiple standards for URLs, right? Um, but fundamentally, what, it, what, is, what this is about is if you have a long page with a lot of content, you can address a specific section of that using this hash part, right? Like hash subsection in the second example here. It is navigating within the given page. Crawlers don't care about that. Crawlers care about the entire content of the page as far as we know and as far as we need to. So what we did in the beginning when we came up with single page applications was we used or abused fragments um, these hashes uh, to actually load different content, right? So you would click on a link that goes to slash products, yes, uh, sorry, slash hash products. And then uh, instead of actually just like scrolling to that thing, because that piece of content didn't exist on the page, it would basically trigger a JavaScript event. That JavaScript event would trigger a network request. That network request would get the new content back. And then you would load the different content in. Um, that does not work with crawlers, unfortunately. There used to be a Ajax crawling uh, thing, like a workaround, 
that turned out to be really, really complicated on our end and developers were using it incorrectly and it was really, really hard to test properly. So uh, it turned out that this didn't really work. We deprecated it years ago. So the Ajax crawling is not a thing anymore. Instead, I would like people to use history API if they want to do navigation within a single page application. So this gives you clean URLs and it still allows you to do whatever you need to do to the browser history. Uh, you can use JavaScript to intercept links on your page and then you basically have a working solution that does not break crawlers. The previous solution using hash or fragment URLs does break your crawlability basically. Uh, History API is really well supported. Now a bunch of people might say like, hold on, what about people on IE 10 or IE 9? If you've been on a computer that actually still runs IE 9, they are pretty slow and JavaScript is not necessarily your friend. So if you give them a link that reloads the page that is still a better user experience than giving them JavaScript that loads forever, that's like not a good experience. Um, History API is basically backwards compatible. So I would highly recommend to just stick to History API. Also, and this is not about um, crawling or, or rendering, this is about making sure that you are being representing your page right. Uh, and a lot of single page applications don't because most frameworks basically do not cover this in their documentation. What do I mean by making your content stand out? Well, look at, look at this. So if I'm looking for cute puppers and doggos, uh, we had cats earlier, now we're back to dogs. Um, if I'm looking for dogs uh, or dog pictures online and I, I search for cute doggos and puppers and I get these search results and I look at the title, right? The first thing I look here um, at, the, at the search results at is the title. And then I, the first one, 40 of the cutest, fluffiest and cuddliest puppers and doggos. That sounds pretty promising. The second one, cutest doggos, at cutest doggos on Twitter not as promising. And then the third one is like 21 joyous photos of doggos and puppers. Sure, quality over quantity, but still 40 is giving me a better feeling for this. Um, but I might not be sure. So like, should I, should I choose the 40 or the 21? So I might read the description as well. So in the description, this is like 40 of the cutest dogs alive, which is pretty good. So they're still alive. That's great. So I can actually potentially meet and cuddle them. Nice. The other one is like, we recently asked subscribers then and us to, to submit their super cute pets. Hold on, I'm, I don't wanna be like pet racist or anything, but uh, I'm looking for doggos. And if these are like 21 pets, then it's not sure that I'm actually gonna see just doggos. It might just be other pets as well. And also, if you've ever met any dog owner, they always think that their dog is the cutest and that's objectively wrong. So um, your description and your title help me make a more informed decision on which search result is the right one for me. So you highly profit from definitely making sure that you are giving us as much information as possible and the searcher as much information as possible through the title and the meta description, right? Now, how do you do that? Um, or why, why would you need that? Give me, let's, let's uh, take another example. So if, if you are a, I don't know, Angular, React, Vue, Ember, whatever application, and you follow the documentation and you build your thing and you're happy that it works, you might actually show up like this in search results. Barbara's baking block, Barbara's baking block, Barbara's baking block. You will rank high for the things that you do, it's like uh, great baking recipes. Cool. Um, all of these pages contain great baking recipes, but I don't know what kind of recipe I'll, I'll get here. And it's a very generic, uh, thing that is the same for all pages of this of this website. So that's not really helping. And the meta description is the same here as well. So like, that's not great. Instead, if you give me an experience like this, where you tell me what is this page about, and then give me a description that explains why this thing is great and what, what it contains, then I can make my judgment much better. And this is not, on, not to blame on you. This is also a problem of documentation that I hope to address uh, later this year as well. Um, that they skip over it and basically have the same meta description and the same title for all your pages, uh, which is definitely not helping you with, um, with search engine optimization or with showing up in search results uh, nicely. So how can you do this? Well, if you're using React, um, there's a fantastic library called React Helmet. 
you install React Helmet, you load it into your component, and then as part of your render function, you have like a helmet bit uh, in your component where you can specify the title and meta tags and what, what else you need, like a link canonical or whatever. Um, and then you can use that to use properties from your component, reactive properties from your component uh, to set the title to something unique and spe specific. And the same goes for, for other things like the description. If you're not using React, uh, Angular has it built in, for instance. Um, they have the title and meta service, does the same thing as the React one. You use it somewhere in your component to uh, make the title from something that is specific to the, to the page, to, to the data, to the properties that you're loading. Um, the same goes for Vue. In Vue.js, you have a package called Vue-meta that gives you a, a, a functionality where you can just have an additional method in your component, a meta info method in this case, and you just return an object with all the things that you need in your um, head section, in your templates, and then that displays or can potentially display a more helpful specific title using properties or computed properties from your components. Cool. If you want to learn more about that, we have a video series available that already has like eight episodes. The videos are relatively short. Um, and uh, we are re recording more videos as well. So it makes sense to subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, and stay tuned for more to come. Now, what are the typical challenges that people are running into? What are things that I get asked quite often about? And we had a few already. Uh, Scott mentioned a bunch. Um, already and I have a few more that I would like to talk about and one is how do you keep unwanted content out and I recently had a conversation with someone uh, at a conference a friend of mine was like I don't get it like it's so simple what's the problem here you just put your thing in the robots txt and then it doesn't get called and everything is good and I'm like well actually that's not necessarily what we want because what you do is you tell us to not crawl which means if the URL shows up in the crawl queue, we're not gonna make an HTTP request to it, right? So you would think, well, that means that it doesn't show up in the index, except it might. Why is that? So to get a really good picture of what a document is about, let's say like I have a page with high school photos that I don't want to show up on uh, Google search. Then I have it under slash private slash high school photos dot HTML. And in my robots, I say Googlebot shall not access or actually crawl anything under slash private, which means it will not crawl my high school photos.html file. The downside though is, oh, um, okay. A voice assistant thought that I talked to him. Um, great. Uh, so then I can't make a I can't make an HTTP request. I can't get all the signals out of this page, but if another page that I can crawl, like some friend's website does not have any Robots 60 disallow, and they link to this and they say like, look at Martin Spitz high school photos here, and they link to slash private slash uh, Martin Spitz high school photo on my website, so like 50 lines of code slash private slash Martin Spitz high school photos dot HTML, um, then we can't crawl this. So we can't gather all the signals, all the information for ranking, but we can assume that if this website is in good faith, if they link to Martin Spitz high school photos, then that, that page is about Martin Spitz high school photos, right? Which means that even though we don't know how good this page really is, we can put it in the index. We probably will never show it unless someone searches for it and we have nothing else to show, or we don't, we don't feel confident about the other results, then we might actually, if we think this is the best result that matches the query very well, then we might show this website. Even though we don't know what is on that website, it's better to not show it because it would hypothetically match so well. In this case, it does show up. It won't have a title, it won't have a meta description because we can't crawl, we can't make an HTTP request to get this information, but it will show up in the index. So then you're like, oh, hold on, but how, how can I exclude it from the index? Well, you can also give us an HTTP re response header or actually an HTML tag uh, which that's, that's called um, meta robots. You can tell us do not index by saying no index. If you say no index, we won't index this page. But now what happens if I have this page in the robots.txt as well? Well, we can't make an HTTP request, so we will never get this HTTP header or the HTML tag, right? We won't see that you tell us to definitely not put it in the index. 
So the right way to do this, to keep something out of the index for sure, is to not put it in the robots.txt and to put it uh, and, and to put a no index there, either as an HTTP header or as, a, as an HTML tag. And then when we crawl, we'll find that specific information and then we will just not put it in the index or if it is in the index, remove it from the index. But then what is robots.txt for? Well, robots.txt is specifically meant for um, prevent, preventing us from accessing resources that you think we don't have to access. If you have like some login API thing, we will never log in. So we don't have to make a login call or like an API call to figure out if we are logged in or not. So you can tell us like, do not use this specific API, you don't need it. Um, you can prevent us from searching, uh, or sorry, from, from crawling certain image URLs, uh, all sorts of things. Like you can basically reduce the amount of requests that we make, um, but you should not use that for anything that is relevant to render the page. If you are blocking us from the, from the API, for instance, uh, that is used in the client side rendering to display the content, we can't make these requests either. So do be careful what you put in robots.txt and also be careful with your no index because that literally means we're gonna not index this page. So if you have it on all your pages, you're basically invisible to us and users searching for you. So hmm. then uh, hot topic is lazy loading. So you have a bunch of images and it is just very nice uh, and resource friendly to not load them all in one go. It will also like relieve the network a little bit and also relieve the CPU a little bit and probably make your website more responsive um, to input on a lower powered mobile device. So you can use a lazy loading library to, for instance, load images lazily as the user um, moves through your page. And be careful to not just do like on scroll or something because there might be other ways of getting something visible in the viewport like sizing and stuff. Uh, and then there's just generally a bunch of ways uh, that you might not expect um, especially bots to access your page. Fundamentally, whatever you do, you want to test your implementation. Uh, a really nice quick test is the mobile friendly test. Uh, it only gives you a screenshot of the above the fold content on a mobile phone, but you can see the rendered HTML. So in the HTML, you want to make sure that we have loaded all the images that you have put in uh, in order to make sure that we are actually seeing them. That being said, there is a great way of implementing lazy loading that works really well, and that's uh, the intersection observer. If you're using the intersection observer, you can um, basically be sure that the image is loaded as it becomes visible in the viewport, and then uh, that's a great way of implementing lazy loading. Alternatively, you can also have a fallback for images specific. So no script content gets ignored except for images. We make an exception for images that are in no script tags. Um, as a fallback for lazy loading, and that has been there for years. Alternatively, we also support lazy loading using the uh, loading equals lazy feature that Chrome has shipped recently. I hope that other browsers are catching up soon. Uh, it's a really, really nice and easy way to get your images la load lazily as the user um, makes, makes their way through, through your page, which is pretty cool. But lazy loading is a great strategy. It does not hurt your SEO. You just have to make sure that you test it properly. Uh, I would recommend implementing it with Intersection Observer. Uh, if you use a library, test that very well. Um, no script fallbacks are also a way around this. Uh, but na native lazy loading is a great way of um, giving this to users that are using browsers where they support it. So if you use that as a fallback mechanism, basically Chrome would fall back to the lazy loading that's natively built in. Um, and lazy loading just is a really nice way of saving resources and making sure that users are having a good experience. And fundamentally, search engines do care about your user experience or your user's experience, right? Cool. Then I keep getting asked about pagination. Uh, there was a bit of a situation uh, earlier last year, and actually it was this year, earlier this year, uh, where we used to have guidance that said, have a link rel next and the link rel prev for the previous and next pages, respectively. Um, we are no longer using that. That doesn't mean that if you have it that you need to remove it. It's still additional information. Other crawlers might use it, I don't know. Um, but we are not using it anymore. Uh, you will be fine as long as you give us proper links to the different pages of your pagination. If you give us links to each of these pages or at least like to some pages surrounding the current page, then we will discover these links and then we will crawl these links as well, right? 
So do make sure that you don't use like buttons or something else or spans or I don't know what um, to do the pagination on your paginated content. Also, if you are experiencing problems, because we consider these links to be relatively weak, maybe that might happen sometimes, uh, then you can help us by providing a sitemap with the pages that you really care for. Um, so that's, that's also a way around this, this uh, that you can make discovery uh, a little more obvious for us by providing them in the sitemap. However, you wanna avoid having infinite crawl spaces. What do I mean by infinite crawl spaces? If you always have a link to the next page and then you just show like no more results or you show the last page or something like that, or you, you, you wrap around and show the first page and I can basically go to page 999 and 9,999 and so on and so forth without actually having content there, then that will eat up your crawl budget for no good reason. So you wanna avoid accidentally using pagination in a way where we then don't see that the pagination is done, like there's no more content uh, in this pagination. Um, just do not give us pages that are not actual individual pages. Like if you have 10 pages of products, tell us so. Do not have like a magical next link that we can potentially discover and then go to page 11 out of 10 where you show either nothing or different content or I don't know what you're gonna show, but don't do that because we're gonna basically keep clicking on, on or not clicking, we keep discovering whatever is linked as next page in that case. Um, and we might get trapped in there and then you eat up your crawl budget for no good reason. Now, web components are an interesting one um, where I, whoops, sorry, where I would say I definitely prefer um, web components authors to consider working with Light DOM. Light DOM is the DOM that the user of your web component puts inside your web component. Composition is a really powerful feature. If you do use Light DOM content, use slots to pull them into your uh, Shadow DOM. So Shadow DOM is where you implement the internals of your component, and then you pull content in from the author uh, who puts it in, who puts HTML into your component by using slots. So unless you have a like I don't know a fancy button element or something, if it's like a tab box for instance, you want the author to define what the content looks like and you want that to live in Light DOM so that um, browsers and crawlers that do not support web components properly can see that content. Uh, if you load content dynamically, do put it in the Shadow DOM. We are able to see content in Shadow DOM, um, but it can get quite confusing sometimes. So if this is my component, what it does is it has a Shadow DOM attached to it, uh, then it puts something into the shadow DOM and then it uses a slot to pull something in from the light DOM. And then when I use this component, I have some light DOM. So what's the light DOM here? Well, I use the component with, or is this indexed up? Um, that basically is the light DOM content. Uh, the shadow DOM content is, is this indexed? What about this? And then we have the projected content that moves from the shadow DOM into the light DOM. Uh, so moves from the light DOM into the shadow DOM uh, in the slot element, what will Googlebot see? Well, it turns out we actually see uh, everything. We would see, is this indexed? What about this? Or is this indexed up? So we see everything, but if you would take out the slot part of your shadow DOM, we wouldn't see the last sentence. We wouldn't see, or is this indexed up? It would just be overwritten by the shadow DOM. So be very, very careful in how you build and structure your, your web components. Um, also, other, other browsers might not actually support it. So Shadow DOM beats unslotted Light DOM. Light DOM that is not projected into Shadow DOM using the slot element is just overridden by Shadow DOM. Shadow DOM wins in this situation. However, that's the situation for Googlebot. I can't speak for other bots. I can't speak for other search engines. If they don't inspect Shadow DOM, then you might not. Uh, actually see this problem or you might get a different result. That's why I think projection uh, using slots is a very, very powerful and important technique for web component authors. Um, web Fundamentals has a, an article on web components best practices. It mentions this there as well, that Shadow DOM overrides unprojected Light DOM. Now, what do you do when you have multiple URLs pointing to the same thing? A few people will tell you, oh, that's really bad. Uh, search engines are gonna like 
give you a bad time about it, that's not true. Like you have no control over if someone else uh, takes your content and, and puts it up somewhere else. The, the issue there is uh, that we have to decide which is the original content and which is the duplicate. And sometimes duplication is not even very obvious. So let's say I have a website where every dog has a profile. Uh, for instance, Leica has the profile slash dog slash Leica. But then people can rate these dogs. And one dog is obviously the top dog because it gets the highest ratings. Cool. Maybe Leica is the top dog right now. And as we crawl both of these, we see the same content. So we're like, oh, okay. So we have top dog, which is the same as Leica. Hmm. What do we do now? We have to make a guess, right? So we would basically just like figure out which we think is the, is the duplication and then throw that away. If we do that wrong, then that's not a good experience, right? If we would consider top dog to be the canonical as in like the, the one that we think is the original one, then people would click on a search result that says Leica, but then get a different dog if that one is the top dog right now, right? Luckily, you can tell us what you want the canonical to be. In this case, if both pages would have this link rel canonical, href dog Leica, you would tell us like, oh, so we are looking at top dog, but this is just a duplication of this other document. That's cool. So um, in that case, we can then know what should be the canonical. However, canonicals are quite powerful. If let's say you have a blog and your canonicals are always pointing to the main page, then you might actually experience that we are not indexing or showing any of your blog posts anymore because they're all pointing to the home page. So that's a risky, risky thing. And we know that it's a risky thing. And sometimes people get it wrong. So sometimes we might just ignore it. Um, a very popular example is in the region that we are in here. So Switzerland, Austria, and Germany are all German speaking, partially German speaking countries. Um, and sometimes companies have the same pages or the same content for each of them with very, very small adjustments. Let's say like you have an online shop, the products are the same, it's just the price is different. And uh, because Switzerland is not part of the Euro um, or the, the currency union, then that means that you have a different currency and a different price, fair enough. But that's like a tiny difference. So we consider the content to be the same. Now, if you tell us that the Swiss version is canonical and the German version is canonical, as in like .de, .ch are both canonical, then we are like, but they are the same as far as we can tell, like they are pretty much the same thing. So what's the point here? Uh, and we will actually disregard one of them. If you give us markup that says that this is a localized version of one each other, like if you tell the CH version is just the CH, like .ch is just this, the Swiss version of the other page, and the other page is just German version of the Swiss page, basically if you give us this href lang, it's called setup, then we might consider still indexing the other ones, not necessarily showing them. So we would still consider the .ch uh, duplication of the .de probably, or the other way around, whatever we canonicalize. But a user in Switzerland would see the .ch domain, a user in Germany would see the .de domain. So like there are ways around this, but fundamentally um, you get to help us pick a canonical, but fundamentally we have to make the decision. So we might decide differently than you do. Another thing that happens specifically in single page applications is soft error pages. I go to a URL that doesn't exist. I get an error. All good, right? Well. The way that single page applications are normally set up is that the server responds with 200 to whatever request they get. They give you the index that loads the JavaScript. The JavaScript then decides what route to trigger. In this case, it triggers the error route, so it shows an error message. But the server has told us this is an actual successful fetch. There is content here. Look at this content, right? So that's not great for bots. And Googlebot doesn't exactly love this either. So it's like, hmm. Yeah, uh, like this page is an error page and we detect this. We usually detect this and we call this a soft 404 where it's a 404 page, but it doesn't tell us that it's a 404 page. It tells us this is a fine page, this is content, you're all good. And um, this leads to interesting situations sometimes because sometimes we don't catch them. And when we don't catch them, it can lead to situations like this 
where an error occurred as part of your search result. That's not great for anyone either. So how can you solve this in a single page application where your server has to serve routes that it doesn't know as successful and then the JavaScript needs to determine if that route is actually having content or if this is an error case, right? So let's, let's look at this um, Kitten Club website. Uh, it makes, it's a single page app. It makes an API call to this cat's uh, API and then it gets a response back and if the cat doesn't exist, it will show an error. Instead of just showing an error, what it does is it redirects though. So it redirects to a URL where the server actually knows that this URL, unlike any of the others, this URL should give a 404 in an error page. Uh, so the server can respond correctly. What happens now is that Googlebot comes, sees this URL, um, crawls this URL, makes an HTTP request. The HTTP request comes back with uh, a bunch of, of HTML and JavaScript. The renderer executes the JavaScript, redirects to a, uh, another page. The page gets fetched. That fetch to slash not found in this case gets a 404 and then we're like, okay, so this, this page doesn't have content that we should index. It only has content that redirects to another page. That page does no longer or doesn't exist. Um, so this page does not get indexed because it doesn't exist. Like it just redirects to a thing that doesn't exist. So this is a 404. That solves the problem. Alternatively, if you have a meta robots tag somewhere or if you add one, you can do that as well. If you have a meta tag or you want to update the meta tag, you can do that. You can tell us, um, basically dynamically tell us, do not index this page. And we'll just like value that. Again, the crawler makes the request, the renderer renders the page, the renderer uh, renders a no, no index meta tag that goes back to processing. Processing sees the no index in the HTML and then cancels it out and removes it from the index if it has been in the index beforehand. So this page will also not end up in the index. Now I made a mistake though. Um, I made an interesting mistake where I had a meta tag with no index on all my HTML pages. And only if the API response came back positively, I switched it to do index this by saying content shall be set to all, which means index and follow links. Well, does that work? The answer is it doesn't. It doesn't work because if you look at the pipeline, what happens here is the crawler makes, makes an HTTP request, gets a response back. In the response HTML, it says no index. So the processing at this stage knows, okay, this page does not want to be an index. So it removes the page from the index or so it doesn't let it go through the index, but it also does not render it. Why would I render a page when I already know that it doesn't need to be indexed? So if I know that it doesn't want to be in the index, I don't render it, which means I don't execute the JavaScript. So all pages disappeared from search. Bad experience. Don't do this. Not great. Last but not least, I think we're pretty much uh, on, on time for Q and A. Um, these are a bunch of links that I would like you to, uh, I don't know, screenshot or take note of um, because these, uh, these links are fantastic resources for further digging in. So if you wanna see the JavaScript SEO video series, uh, that's the playlist on YouTube. We have a bunch of guides that help you um, with all sorts of different topics, internationalization, structured data, rich results, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you suffer specifically from JavaScript problems, then we have a troubleshooter guide that uh, addresses a bunch of issues. If you run into other issues that are not mentioned in the troubleshooter guide, please let me know. I'll be happy to expand that guide. If you want to do like more hands-on tutorial stuff, we have code labs that are like hands-on step-by-step tutorials um, that you can use to go through. Um, like one is specifically like how to fix things for single page applications SEO wise. So pretty much everything that I discussed, you have an application, a single page app that is really bad and you learn how to improve it step-by-step. -step. It has a bit of outdated information in there that I will remove very soon, hopefully this week. Um, but fundamentally, it's, it still holds true and is very, very valuable. Uh, we have a YouTube channel where we upload a bunch of stuff and we do um, bi-weekly office hours there as well. If you go on the community tab in our YouTube channel, you can ask your questions and get them answered. We record these so you can also see previous ones if you can't make it to the Hangout live uh, and you can watch our stream. You can see the recordings. Um, yeah, and we have a Twitter account where we announce news uh, and stuff that happens on search as well. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope that this was useful. Martin? Yes. Uh, 
Thank you very much, first of all. Um, while you have that slide open, um, are you able to do a quick copy and paste into the uh, webinar chat? I actually can, yes. I, I could type it out, but I'd, I figured I'd ask first. Let me see. All right, uh, pulling this over. Here we go. There we go. Perfect. Thank you very much. You are welcome. Um, oh, cat. Um, so we have Vitaly here as well. Vitaly has Hello, the, everyone. The, the Q and A master. So I'm going to um, just kind of back off again and hand it over to Vitaly. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Martin, for the wonderful presentation. Actually, before we join in, I think that somebody raised their hand. Mm, one of the attendees wanted to ask a question, I believe. Um, yeah, so actually, uh, Josu Zarzosa is asking, I'm embedding parts of my site using iframes. I know, shame on me. Uh, does that content get indexed? That is a great question. Um, I have that on my to-do list to figure out how exactly we are treating iframes right now. As far as I can tell, this might be in it. Like the easiest way to find out is um, you, if it's, is it, is it iframes from your own domain or is that like coming from a different domain? Uh, because if they are coming from your, from your domain, that should just be fine. Uh, you can do like a site colon and then enter your domain and then you see what we have in the index. Uh, if these pages are showing up, then yes, they are indexed correctly. If they don't show up, um, then I would definitely see if you can either link to them properly or if you can use a sitemap to tell us about these URLs. Um, what might happen and I think happens is I believe, and I'm not sure about this, that iframes are not counted as content of the current URL. So if you have like slash products XYZ, and then you have an iframe that loads the product details, then this is not part of that specific URL's content. It is considered as content of a different URL. So that URL will be indexed but it, and actually show up for the uh, specific content. But um, I heard that we uh, have been at least experimenting with changing that or working that differently, but I'm not sure if that led anywhere and I need to figure that one out. Very good question. Uh, stay tuned on Twitter <laughs> for the yes. answer, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question indeed. Um, so Martin, Bob, we may be gathering more questions here. Um, I have a couple as well. Uh, specifically, uh, I think I read an article at some point. I wanted to confirm if that's true or not. Um, essentially, because of the JavaScript being delayed, potentially, if it's a single page application and uh, it needs to be parsed and executed and all of that and rendered. Um, so if you have two websites, two news websites, and one of them is serving content client-side mostly, um, and the other maybe client-side with pre-rendering, and the third just server-side. Um, can you say with certainty that, for example, one of them will be slower in indexing or showing up in search results, like imagine there are elections coming up, um, or somebody wants to, you know, typing elections US 2020 or so, um, can you say that one of them is definitely going to be slower than the others? The JavaScript client-side rendered one will definitely be a little slower. How much slower is debatable, um, because it depends on a lot of different circumstances. It might literally just be minutes faster, it might also be actually like hours or sometimes even days faster than the, uh, mm -hmm. like the, the non, sorry, slower. Yeah, <laughs> the JavaScript okay. client-side rendered one will definitely be slower because we have to go through rendering. Um, but on the other hand, if the other page is new, it goes through rendering anyways. And most of mm -hmm. the time the, the delay is minimal. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Brian is wondering, what's the best way to tell Google crawler that page pagination has ended? By not providing us links to any, any other page, as in like, if you have a pagination and say like, page one, two, three, just don't give us a next link if we are on page four already, or page three already. Like if, if there is no page four, don't give us a link that suggests that there is a page four. Mm -hmm. uh, Ivan or Ivan is wondering, what happens if you have no iframe content, content between the iframe tags? Aha. Um, I think content between iframe tags is mostly ignored anyways. Uh, so that's fine. I don't okay. think we are, we are indexing that. That's a very interesting question, but I don't think we're indexing that. Yeah, okay. Um, it's interesting that if you type somebody's name and some people prefer to type their own names, um, it's interesting how much higher sometimes Facebook and LinkedIn are ranked compared to, let's say, somebody's personal web page. 
So um, maybe you could shed some light into how much weight social media or social presence uh, ranks, for example, for, uh, for a name or for a brand. How well, important? That that is goes it like, into the yeah that goes into the entire like ranking discussion and um, we shouldn't go there. Well, you, we can. It's just like I can't say much. Like the not okay. not because I I'm not allowed to literally just because like I don't know. Uh, okay. I I keep away from ranking as much as I as I can. There's as I said like there's many many factors that we are pulling in for ranking, um, and it it can be so many different things. Why this page is higher ranked than right. your personal website? Okay, but then on the other side we have so many SEO voodoo's. Uh, that build up uh, content media marketing strategy and build up websites and so on to increase ranking and so on. Um, so maybe you could, um, I mean, there are a couple of strategies, right? In the past, mm -hmm. we had all kinds of link forms and all that. Maybe there are some white hats. Um, mm -hmm. Well, that's a weird word to use here, but maybe there are some decent strategies to recommend to use <laughs> and some to definitely stay away from, but that are maybe quite prevalent in the community these days. So... This entire link buying and guest posting business is pretty dangerous because if it's done maliciously, and most of it is malicious, it's like if I pay you to link to my website, right? Something is playing music now. That's amazing. It's not me. It's not Probably me. Either. You're talking it to some devices in your kitchen again. Interesting. Spotify decided to play some random song. That's amazing. Okay. Maybe I was, was using was my, my headphones. That's on, that's on. Yeah, maybe I was using my headphones in order to turn on something on your device. That was fun. Um, lovely. Hi, Spotify. Uh, yeah. So regarding uh, regarding that, like link building, if it's done right, as in like if someone organically thinks that your stuff is good, and you uh, you like basically get into a relationship with them, then that's perfectly fine. Buying links is just a very, very bad strategy because eventually we'll find out that it's non-organic links that happen. And then, yeah, that gets tricky. Now you have additional meta properties where you can say like, this is a sponsored link. And that's a better way of, of dealing with these situations without putting yourself into hot water. Um, good strategies that I feel are underutilized, especially mm -hmm. in the startup world, is um, building different landing pages, especially if, you have one product, but like different user groups that are using your product that are looking at your product in a, from a different way. Um, understanding them and providing content for them is very, very important. I like to make this example um, with cars, for instance. If I am someone who is looking to buy a car, I might go to a website that explains to me why this car is great for me. If I am a company representative who's looking for a company car, I might not be interested in the, in the specific details for an individual buyer, but I might have different questions that are you not answering in your page for the private buyer. So why don't you have a page that explains to me as a potential leasing customer why I would lease that specific car and so on and so forth, right? You wanna have pages that are catering to these different audiences and have content that is specific to these different audiences. It's absolutely fine to have 10, 20, 50 landing pages for different kinds of requests and queries. Um, that is absolutely legitimate because you just give better content to different kinds of people mm -hmm. or represent the same content in different ways. That's also great. Um, it's just very sad when people are not doing it. And also linking internally is just so important. If I land on a page that explains to me how I can sell something on your website then having a link to somewhere where I can sign up or having like a clear call to action for me if I want to buy something or want to sell something um, is just so important because it also helps us understand the relation between the different pages of your website much much better than a sitemap could do because in a sitemap you just tell us these websites exist uh, sorry these pages exist on this website versus this page leads hopefully leads someone into this and then that leads to them Related articles, related information, related content is important and generally uh, underutilized, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good point to bring up. Axel uh, probably wants to start a fight at this point because Axel is wondering, what's your take on server-side JavaScript rendering versus client-side rendering? Our tech people plan to switch to server-side to speed up the site. Any advice? We have been very clear about this in our Google I.O. Um, 
session on, on JavaScript sites and SEO, uh, server-side rendering is a great strategic investment. Um, it makes your sites faster, not only for crawlers, but also for users. Uh, it, it does prevent a bunch of, an entire class of issues that might happen when JavaScript gets involved on the client-side rendering side. So um, I think it's a great idea to, to use server-side rendering and maybe hydration rather than client-side rendering. From a perspective, from a performance perspective, from an accessibility perspective, from a user experience perspective, from an SEO perspective. And the general advice is test, test, test. Make sure that your content shows up well, that you don't have any weird glitches, that you don't have any weird edge cases. Um, yeah. Okay, that sounds uh, like a sound advice, uh, Mr. Split. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, excellent. I think we don't have that many more many more questions uh, at this point. I was actually very surprised when I saw your talk in Zurich because I didn't attend when I was in Zurich and I saw it later, I watched it later. Um, and you Thank actually you. started an interesting, because you were looking at the history of the web and how yeah. it all evolved and what it even, even means for today. And I started this discussion kind of, uh, which, I don't know, I got goosebumps when I heard it. Uh, when you were comparing Flash with JavaScript today yeah. in some way. Uh, so maybe you could, uh, it's, I know it's a very different topic, but I was just really a little bit, I don't know, I, I didn't know how to react to that. So maybe you could bring up the arguments and we have more people joining in the fight to have a conversation. So I think, um, I think so there, there are differences between Flash and, and JavaScript, but there's also some similarities, right? So uh, the differences are that JavaScript actually is part of the web platform and it evolves as part of such, like the, the web developers who are using CSS, HTML are also using JavaScript, that's great. And we are like basically using JavaScript to extend and experiment on the platform rather than building like a little boxed thing and pretending that we don't uh, live in, in the browser and don't live on the web. That being said, some of these experiments, I believe took us in a direction where a bunch of people, I, I get nervous when I hear people saying I'm a JavaScript developer because mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, if you're literally just building Node.js applications or, or like JavaScript applications that run on embedded devices, sure, you are a JavaScript developer. But if you are using JavaScript in some sort of form um, that fundamentally then creates HTML on the fly, then you are not a JavaScript developer because you have to understand what your what your code builds and creates and, and fundamentally then it does not create an interface directly it, it, it creates an intermediate that mm -hmm. then creates the interface and if we are if we are lying to ourselves and saying like html and css don't matter they're just like side effects and they're just like plumbing and we don't care then we are missing out on what the web really is Fundamentally, it is semantic content. That's where it starts. And if I see like div within div within div within div, mm -hmm. just to do something that I can do with one div and some CSS, then I'm like, maybe you're not, you're using, you're working against the platform here by trying to build this, this closed box that Flash was um, so that you can isolate yourself from what you feel is a hostile environment when really this hostile environment is just a little more complicated than you thought maybe, but it is complicated for very good reasons because the web is a very flexible, very fluid platform and mm. not understanding that and pretending that it is not. Oh, this is just like, I know how my website looks like. No, you don't. No, you don't. You'll have no idea how your website is gonna look like. Um, because you don't know what the window size is going to be, what the color depth is going to be, what the, what the situation that your user is, uh, is, is going to be like. So it is good that CSS gives us the flexibility to say like, size it like this, use as much space as you can, but don't use less than this much, and, and so on and so forth. Basically, this responsiveness of the platform is not in JavaScript. It is in CSS, it is in HTML. And we should embrace that rather than like be put off from that. And if we are like, oh, no, this is weird and I, this is different, I don't want that. I just want my JavaScript world here, which is predictable as much as, as I can say it's predictable. Um, I think then that's a risky trend. 
Well, I would love to disagree with something. I was looking for some sort of pointers <laughs> to disagree and I couldn't find any. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think in many ways, the way we are thinking about the web today has changed tremendously. Um, but I also find it's quite interesting that there are many discussions about us kind of coming back and looking at the source of where it all started and how it all evolved and where we kind of got lost a little bit along the way. Um, and personally, I do miss Flash. Think whatever you want about me. I, I do miss Flash as well. I, I built really cool stuff with it. And I remember in 2008, I was experimenting with Adobe Air and the Red 5 media server. And I had like voice comments on my blog. And that was like such a weird experiment. I could do it now, I guess. But I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that like between 2008 and today, there was a large gap where I wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah, I think so. Well, we'll see how it's going to evolve over time. Um, there is one more question that actually came up. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, if I link into my site from... Um, from an if external document, I believe, yeah. Yeah, if link into my site for external document in cloud system, is it crawl for site SEO and is it a good idea? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I'm not 100% sure if I understand the question correctly, but if I, if I understand it correctly, you have like an external document on some cloud platform that links into your site and you wonder if that causes crawling on your site. Uh, yeah, um, unless this, this other system says like, do not follow this link and we don't think that we should not follow this link, then this will be in the crawl queue, yes. And then if we have it in the crawl queue, eventually it will be crawled. It's not a bad idea. It's not a, like it's, yeah, it's a, if, if it's a link, if it's a good link, sure. Right. It doesn't hurt. Okay, so just to wrap up, uh, Martin, so looking back and looking forward uh, in the future, what are you most excited about this? There is so much happening all around us. So what is that one thing that really keeps you motivated and energized and wakes you up at night? Uh, or keeps so, you awake at night? What, what wakes me up at night and gets me energized is that the barriers to build stuff on the web are like lowering pretty much every day and we're getting more and more people and more diverse people into this industry. Um, so that excites me and that makes me very happy that we have more and more people creating things and expressing themselves on the web. On the other hand, I know that we need to get better at welcoming these people properly. Um, and making sure that they are safe and that they can express themselves whatever way they want to express themselves in. Um, because I know that, that uh, there is still like gatekeeping in the industry that we need to get rid of, I believe. Um, there is still this weird CSS and HTML. It's not real programming. Look at me. I program JavaScript. And then there's like someone from the C sharp side going like JavaScript is not real programming. Look at me. I program C sharp. This, this stuff like, get a life people uh, but it, it does excite me that we are becoming more approachable and more more easy and open uh, for people to like start contributing and that's amazing if you look at things like glitch.com code pen code sandbox today i literally open my browser i throw together a package json it automatically installs my packages on some vm somewhere i guess um, and then runs the code in the browser and I can experiment right from wherever I am. I could do that on my phone, which is amazing. It's not very comfortable unless I attach a Bluetooth keyboard or something, but I could is the point. Um, yeah. Back in the days, you needed to mail contracts and then get a server and then it's like, oh, but this is a virtual server, so I can't install the PHP version or the PHP extension that I want. I need a proper root server for that. And, all that has eroded and it's, it's just becoming easier and, and more approachable than ever. And that makes me very, very happy and excited. That's very nice and a friendly ending uh, just in time because we actually had three more questions coming in. Uh, <laughs> well, one of them we already answered. Um, there is one from Michael. Will we be covering about how to improve ranking compared to competitors website? Probably not. Uh, no. Ranking, no. no. Okay, and uh, Pawan is wondering, how are links to PDF or other types of media handled by search engines? Um, they're handled as, as links, really. They're just, for us, if you link to a PDF, that's great. Uh, you can totally do that. Um, you can link to a video, you can link to whatever. We just consider it as such content, like it's a PDF content, cool. We can do limited PDF indexing as far as I'm aware. We actually can convert the, the thing internally so that we can understand what the PDF is about. 
So then that basically runs through the entire pipeline as well. Okay, sounds good. All right, Martin, then thank you so much for joining us and for answering all the questions and stuff. Oh, that was a long one, but a good one. Thank you so has much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, and I hope to see you soon again. And I hope that this was useful to y'all. And, yes, uh, thank you. Looking forward to hear more. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. In the meantime, Scott, uh, how are you doing today? I haven't said hello to you yet. Hello, Vitaly. Uh, I am well. How are you? I'm doing very, very good. It's like it's a very good ending. Like, <laughs> oh, look at Martin. He's just looking. Just looking, he's <laughs> peeking behind the scenes. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask you, Scott, do you know what's going to happen next on Smashing TV? Because I do. I, well, why, you're asking me a rhetorical question at this point. Um, it's not rhetorical, it's more like adventures. October 29th, uh, we have Ben Callahan talking about design systems. Um, we're taking a, a break for the next week because we have Smashing Conf New York coming up. So, um, yeah, for anybody who's interested in design systems and how to sell them, whether it's to a client or your employer or just internally within your design or programming team, um, that's the base for the next webinar, October 29th at 1600 GMT, which um, is a lot better for me in the morning. Okay, well, that sounds pretty good. Um, from my side, oh, look at that. Josu and the team with five front-end developers were watching at the office. This is very nice. This is very cool. I don't know where you're from, but uh, warm greetings from us to you. Uh, on my side, just one thing I wanted to mention as well. Um, so we're trying to kind of um, rethink or refine the format for Smashing TV altogether. And we're looking into ways of how to make it a bit more interactive. So that means that starting from that session on design systems, actually, uh, we want to dedicate a significant amount of time to review your work. So maybe have somebody giving you feedback on how you, you know, maybe some things to improve, things to refine and so on. So we'll be running a couple of different sessions from accessibility to uh, UX to design systems, anything. Um, so if you're interested and you'd like to be reviewed live um, by somebody who hopefully has some experience in the topic that you um, are dealing with or struggling with maybe, uh, we'd love to support you in some way so it's worth for you to stay a member and be member and be member members on Smashing. Um, and so for, for that, you can just go ahead and whenever I'm, uh, me or Scott uh, will be posting an announcement about the new webinar coming in, please go ahead and type in an URL and then we'll collect them and we'll bring them up and they will become the, the core or the heart of the webinar. It's not, I mean, you know, talks like the one that Martin has just given are incredible. They're wonderful. Uh, but at the same time, we can also do something that's a little bit even more interactive where imagine Martin next week, maybe Martin next week no maybe not um kind of hey martin so here's a bunch of URLs that we have can you just give us advice of what we should do what we should not do what we're doing wrong actually we do that it's called site clinics <laughs> yeah i know but we i'm not uh, sure we, about next week though but no, no, no it's not yeah. necessarily, it doesn't have to be next week but again the point is for you to kind of get one-to-one uh, -one feedback with somebody um live um that's it's about that uh anything else scott what are your big plans for today I got to go to work. Okay. So that's boring. <laughs> that's just, that's just sad. All the morning here. It's yeah. So that's my plan for the day. I mean, I'll probably have lunch at some point. Okay. That sounds exciting. Martin, yeah. big plans. Uh, I need to do some grocery shopping, which is a fantastically big plan, I guess. And um, then I'll pack my bags for search stars and local host con. Sounds very exciting as well. And I'm going to do some cooking, hopefully. Let's Ooh. see if it works. See if it works. All right. Um, see although, if it works. Uh, well, because I'm in a hotel right now and I love I miss cooking. Uh, that's a long story. Okay, so everyone, thanks for joining. And hopefully see you next time. Or maybe even see you next week in New York. Um, so with this in mind, signing off. Thanks again, Martin. Thanks again, Scott. Thanks, see you everyone. Next time. Thanks, Italy. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Martin. Bye. So have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye.